It's September, and in many parts of the world, that means the start of the school year. But COVID-19 has affected how children are learning, and with their education compromised, so is their future. And that's not all today's 2.2 billion children globally have to contend with. Most of them live in less than ideal circumstances to begin with, and they're paying for the excesses of those who came before them. In the crisis, the children are particularly hard hit. Many of them have been dramatically traumatized by violence. According to health officials here, more than 6 million children could be at risk of malnutrition. The United Nations' most ratified treaty is the one that enshrines the rights of the child, and yet many countries seem to struggle with implementation. Uh, we have child labor, we have uh, early marriages, we have many serious protection problems that need to be addressed. It is a possible lost generation. In this episode of About That, we speak to Banu Bhatnagar. Hi, Marga. I am currently the head of media for Save the Children in Asia, uh, the regional media manager. Working across more than 100 countries, Save the Children is one of the largest agencies championing the rights and interests of the world's most vulnerable children. You were saying that the children in Asia in particular uh, have some of the most pressing needs of children around the world. Why would you say that? Well, look, it's a hugely diverse region. You know, on the one side, you have countries who are ridden with conflict. So particularly Afghanistan, parts of India and Pakistan, even uh, countries like Myanmar, where children's safety is at risk and they're at risk of, you know, being caught in crossfire or you know, experiencing traumatic events like bomb blasts. But then also you have countries that are really struggling to, to improve the lives and livelihoods of their populations. Poor countries like Bangladesh, like Nepal, there are huge issues to do with malnutrition, mm -hmm. to do with access to education, access to healthcare. And to be honest, all of these things have to be also viewed through the lens of climate change, because, you know, this is a region that, that is home to half of the world's population, by some estimates, two thirds of the world's poor. And granted, South Asia makes up a, a large percentage of that. But we know for a fact that it is one of the most disaster prone regions in the world. You know, there's not a year that goes by without some catastrophic extreme weather event or several. A typhoon has slammed into the eastern Philippines as authorities struggle to evacuate hundreds of thousands of people. Typhoon Wang Fong is packing powerful sustained winds. It was the most powerful ever on record, pummeling Micronesia, side-swiping Guam. It's just going to get worse. And so dealing with the issues that we're already dealing with in the region for children, whether it be access to education, child rights, nutrition, healthcare, those things are just going to be harder in a world that's warming, basically. How do you even know where to begin? Is it making sure first that each child is cared for physically and then dealing with any other needs? Yes, absolutely. We need to improve the lives of individual children. And that's where agencies like Save the Children and, and other organizations come in because we work at the community level and we work through partners on the ground, like local NGOs or local civil society organizations that have that trust uh, in the community. Because ultimately, it's about creating behavior change at the community level. But that doesn't mean that we let off our world leaders or the politicians scot-free. I think it's also very important that we target governments, people who actually design policy, which then cascades or infiltrates down to the grassroots level. We go from bottom up and we also go from top down to ensure that uh, the children's rights are upheld. The rights of the child. Children should never be hurt in any way. All children should have houses to live in, places to play, and nice schools. We should be looked after especially when we get sick. And the most important thing is that we need to be safe and happy. What kind of response have you found from the governments that you're dealing with here? Has it been difficult to get them on board? 
I think it's always difficult when you're trying to address sort of structural issues. There are certain ways of working in countries that have been that way for years or even decades. And there's a certain kind of cultural norm or, or accepted practices that make it very difficult. I'll give you an example from, mm-hmm. from Afghanistan because, you know, we've been working very closely with our colleagues in, that, in Afghanistan and the government in Afghanistan to, to help draft new legislation in that country, which it basically gives the child uh, a certain rights, a child rights law, basically. You would think that that's quite a normal or benign legislation, and and many Western countries are sure to have that kind of legislation on their books. But Afghanistan is at a different stage in its development, and and, so we we work very closely with policymakers there to help draft that legislation to protect the rights of the child based on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But the UN defines a child as anyone under 18 years old. We were met with uh, s- sort of some difficulties in Afghanistan when when we approached the subject in that way because they don't necessarily define a child as being anyone younger than 18 years old. And this goes back to culture, religion. A girl is seen as ready to marry when she menstruates, for example. Or, you know, it's a culture where children are often expected to help their families out with work. So let's say a mother or a father t- uh, gets ill, it would be perfectly normal for for a 12 or 13 year old boy to go out and find work to help support his or her family. Now, the minute a child starts to work, again, from a cultural or social perspective, they're seen as not being a child anymore. So we have to deal with these kinds of very nuanced, very difficult issues. It's not just one size fits all. There is no easy solution. But ultimately, we need to keep the child, the interests of the child, at the center of any sort of policy intervention that we, that we engage in. Are child rights even present in, let's say, majority of the country across the Southeast Asian region or the Asian region? Again, it's so hard, you know, because Asia is such a large place. Let, let, let's, take, let's take one of the biggest countries in the region, India. We know for a fact that India has a sort of a secular constitution. It has certain statutes on the book that protect children, certainly protect girls. But we also know it has one of the highest female infanticide rates in the world. And we know that uh, families prefer boys over girls. And this goes back to generations of sort of cultural indoctrination that boys are more valuable and that girls are more costly. I have certainly seen changes in society over the last few years, certainly in India, but also in other parts of Asia, Southeast Asia as well. But that doesn't mean these practices have disappeared. And I think it would be wrong of us as humanitarians, as development professionals, and just as responsible citizens of the world to let our guard down. I don't think it's in Enough to just say, well, that's great, you know, we've reduced child marriage by 20% or 30% or whatever the case might be. It's not enough until it's reduced by 100%. You know, it's not okay for a, a, a young girl to be forced into marriage uh, or to, you know, engage in sexual behavior when she doesn't feel ready for it. Again, you know full well that the age of consent in the Philippines is is so low. I believe it's 12 years old, which is, I think, one of the lowest in the world. In fact, I think only one might be lower, and I think it might be somewhere in West Africa. But it's really quite crazy if you think about it. How can a 12-year-old girl consent when we're talking about power structures, right? What is sex if not kind of a... A, a power game, you know, and uh, yes. and at the best of times, even between adults. And so how can a 12 year old girl consent to a man that might be twice her age? Clearly, there is a huge power imbalance in that relationship, which to me strikes it as odd that that would be consensual. We actually did that story for Al Jazeera. It was one of the first stories I believe we did when we set up the bureau here because it was mm-hmm. shocking. That was the case. Many pedophiles use as a defense an old Spanish law introduced in 1887 that sets the age of consent at just 12 years old. Most Filipinos aren't even aware the law exists. It's not something that the legislators seemed in a hurry to change. Is that one of the bigger issues, that the adults running the government and making the policies don't make children their priority? And if that's the case, then you're kind of hard-pressed to then make them pay attention to climate change and do something about it. 
Just on your first point there, you're absolutely right. And again, this goes back to this notion of like, how do you start to change the structures, right? The, the, the decision making structures that in the people who hold the power, you know, in the Philippines case, for example, legislators or policymakers won't make an about turn from a policy perspective unless there's a benefit to it. They're, they have to see the benefit to their own constituents. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's a, it's a voting game. And so once you start to change public opinion, and this is why it's so important that we engage with communities, that we engage with the media, very importantly, that we start to tell the stories of children or the, or the stories of injustice that happen in our communities and that people become aware of those and that we also start to create champions like child champions, right? So you can have Let's say, I don't know, it could be a, it could be a woman in her twenties who actually got married very young and who can then become a spokesperson and, and a champion for other girls and go to parliament and fight that case. And as you start to change public opinion, I guarantee you the legislator will have to change his or her mind as well, because those people who are sitting in power have been placed there you know, give or take. But, you know, in most countries, they have been placed there unless it's a kingdom and autocratic system. Um, right. And they have been placed there by their constituents. But if their constituents suddenly say, you know what, the biggest issue for me is there's too much child marriage in my community and I've had enough of it, then that legislator will have to change their tune. So again, it goes back to this point about a bottom up approach, as well as targeting the people right at the top. And you were saying that you guys do a lot of work as well with climate change. Have yes. you found that children are more aware now of what's happening around them than they might have been maybe five, ten years ago? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, you know, you, you will know full well how pivotal climate change and children was in 2019 with all those protests that, that sort of swept the yes. world, led by Greta Thunberg. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you! And, uh, you know, it created this wave of, of sort of child led protests, the Friday walkouts from school. And I, th I think it's, it's only right, actually, that children are starting to wake up to the mistakes of, of past generations and rightfully calling out those mistakes and saying, you know what, this, this is not the world that I want to inherit. I mean, a lot of critics would say, well, you know, they're kids and what do they know? Don't they know that, you know, the world is already investing into renewables and this and that. But the point is, that's how children feel. And it's important for us to listen, to listen to what they're, what they're saying. So you have to remember that, you know, children have contributed the least to global heating, but are among the worst affected by it. And especially the most poor and vulnerable communities, you know, they're already feeling the impacts uh, of the climate crisis. For example, floods, you know, they threaten children's lives and development. They cause injuries and death by drowning. They contaminate water supplies and they leave schools damaged or turned into emergency shelters. And we're seeing increased extreme weather events as a direct result of climate change. And again, once again, the poorest and most marginalized uh, children will, will suffer the most. In Asia, for example, the lowest lying areas, the coastal areas, are generally inhabited by the poorest people. We know for a fact that some of the Pacific islands would disappear entirely with just a one meter sea level rise. We also know that would essentially drown something like, mm, I think, like 40 million people uh, in, in right. East Asia alone. So children have been saying for a long time that we need to do something. But unfortunately, coronavirus happened and sort of silenced everything, didn't it? You know, the global pandemic essentially just shifted everyone's attention. How then do you begin to work with the grown-ups in different parts of the world if they respond differently to the children in their societies? I mean, from what you've illustrated, different parts of the world treat their children differently? That's a really big question, Marga. Look, I'm going to refer back to the fact that Save the Children's founder, so Save the Children's about 100, 101 years old now. It was founded in 1919. And Save the Children's founder, Eglantine Jeb, essentially wrote the very first sort of 
the precursor, I guess you could call it, to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So she wrote down a set of ultimate truths, I guess you could say, uh, or rights, inalienable rights that children have, and that then later became the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So that essentially is how we as an organization view children under the guise of a, of a very sort of standardized set of definitions and rights uh, that are based on the UN. That said, it's not always easy to place that convention on people's desks and say, look, this is how you should view children, because people see that as an infringement on their sovereignty. You know, people say that, well, who is the UN to tell me how to yeah. how to behave in my backyard, right? And so again, this goes back to the point of winning hearts and minds, showing how, you know, certain policies or certain ways of thinking or legislation actually works for the benefit, not just of the child, but of society as a whole. So for example, making communities understand why it's important that girls girls are educated and why it's important that actually if your girl goes to school, that means her children are likely to go to school and probably even go to university. If a girl goes to school, she's much more likely not to have 12 children, maybe only three children and be able to feed them all. It, it, it's about winning hearts and minds and that doesn't happen quickly. What do you think it is that is the resistance then? How is this so difficult for people to understand that you have to do something for the children? Oh gosh, I mean, I don't have, I don't sure I have an answer to that question. I think it goes back yeah. to, to culture and it goes, and I'm not, you know, I'm not dissing one culture over another at all. I'm just saying sometimes certain practices become so ingrained. Let's take my family. You know, I come from a, a quite an educated middle class Indian family. And like I sometimes, you know, I talk to my grandma. Obviously she's two generations above me. But she still talks about her daughters differently to how she talks about her son. And so she's right. clearly carrying that kind of paradigm or, or in her mind where girls are considered weaker or they're considered, you know, like they need more protection than boys do, right. et cetera. It's a very, very kind of old fashioned way of thinking. Right. And I guess if you asked your grandparents, they'd probably say the same thing. So I think this permeates through an entire nation as well. And so, you know, I don't think there's a, there's a simple answer. I think, like I said, you have to win hearts and minds one by one and make people understand that investing in children, addressing climate change, and listening to children, giving them a voice, is actually going to benefit society in the end. I mean, you and I are going to be gone, and the children are the ones that will run this planet. What has been the most challenging part of trying to get the message across that children's rights are important, that climate change has to be paid attention to so that the future is assured? There's a simple answer to that, because um, and it goes back to this point of like, do we actually have any impact? And I sometimes question myself, you know, because I'm working in countries that are have been in conflict like Afghanistan for 40 years. Think about it. Like every single child in that country has known nothing but conflict. They don't know any different. And when I'm working in countries like that and I see that, you know, we are, let's say, setting up a, a school for girls in a community where where girls never used to get educated and now their parents are allowing them to go to school, etc. You know, that makes me happy. And, and I and I see that we are having that kind of grassroots impact. But sometimes I question it as well, because I'm like, well, what does it matter? Because these girls will never go to university. They'll be married off as soon as they reach a certain age. And so, sure, the education was useful. But has anything actually changed in society? And that's a question I ask myself time and time again that like that's probably the hardest thing in answer to your question are we actually changing society are we actually helping to end conflict are we actually and helping to create policies that save our environment that uh, ensure sustainability and equity and justice for everyone and i think that is probably the hardest thing for me but yeah you just keep going it's really important that we give kids the tools they need to actually influence their lives. When you think about the future today, you don't think beyond the year 2050. By then, I will, in the best case, not even have lived half of my life. What we do or don't do right now 
will affect my entire life and the lives of my children and grandchildren. What we do or don't do right now, me and my generation can't undo in the future. And why should I be studying for a future that soon will be no more? So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then, and only then, hope will come. So we can't save the world by playing by the rules. Because the rules have to be changed. Everything needs to change. And it has to start today. Teenage Swedish activist Greta Thunberg closing this episode of About That. As always, we hope we've given you food for thought and hope that spurs you into action. I'm Marga Ortigas. Thank you for joining us.